This has been really wonderfully co-sponsored by a group of local libraries, Jaffrey, Keene, Peterborough, and today's program in particular is sponsored by the Hancock Town Library. Um, they are a wonderful library, do incredible programming, and a fabulous kind of resource. You can check them out online at the Hancock Town Library website if you want to find out more about it. And we're so grateful to them to be our partner. And I'll just take a few minutes to tell you a little bit about the Harris Center in case you're um, zooming in from somewhere not familiar with it. Uh, Harris Center is located in Hancock, New Hampshire, and we have been around for a, a little over 50 years. And through that time, our real goal has been helping people fall in love with this place where we live. And we do that in many different ways, including protecting land. We have over 24,000 acres of protected land. That land is um, open and ac accessible to the public. We have lots of trails, miles and miles of trails for people to hike on and experience. We also do this through education in pre-K through high school programming in our public schools in the Monadnock region, all science-based and hands-on right up to these alley as we'll be finding out hopefully. Um, and then also we have community programs like this and we have programs that Karen just talked about where we are working really hard to um, do conservation research projects and programs to help our wildlife and, um, um, and our natural lands kind of be studied and, and do the best we can to help all those animals and plants stay, stay healthy and good. Um, so I'm so lucky because today I get to introduce Chitty Page, who I just feel so lucky that I discovered sort of randomly when I was looking for Christmas gifts for my children on, um, on how to become a better birder. And I discovered her game Birdwiser, which we love. And um, it's such a beautiful game. So I wanna just tell you about Chitty. Um, she is passionate about STEM education, advocacy, and is especially interested in developing youth and community programs that and instill a love of science in ages 6 through 18, but I bet she's probably all ages. <laughs> um, as a biologist and an educator over the past 10 years, Chitty has been a consultant on a variety of innovative projects and panels. She was the inaugural manager of education programs at Columbia University Zuckerman Institute and managed the Institute's existing initiatives, such as the Brainiac program, which is a neuroscience research mentoring program for high school students. Students. Fascinating. Throughout her career, Chitty has developed experiences for her students that are dynamic, hands-on, and definitely fun. Taking her passions to teach science through intentional play and learning games, she developed and created Birdwiser, a classic tabletop game. And I hear that there's more games like that in the works. So I'm super excited from one educator to another to welcome Chitty Page here today for the Harris Center. Take it away, Chitty. Thank you so much. Thank you um, for that amazing uh, introduction. And thanks everyone for joining us. So I want to thank Susie uh, for that introduction and, um, and for all you do actually at the Harris, at the Harris Center for Conservation Education. Um, it is a course dear to my heart, as you may know. Um, and I also want to take a moment to appreciate Hancock Town Library and the network of libraries sponsoring this event. So uh, thank you and thank you everyone for joining us today. So during this uh, presentation, I will share different phases of my journey and struggles as a science student in Nigeria and how those experiences um, applied to my career in STEM education and STEM game designing um, and we'll also explore some strategies that came out of those experiences that I've used as a result of the stories, the stories you will hear and how it applied to almost two decades with um, working with youth and family programs um, during my tenure particularly at Newark Museum and Columbia University like Susie mentioned Susie shared a bit of my resume over there. Um, just, you know, there's a lot of STEM educators, STEM game designers, STEM manager, uh, a lot of signs that is attached to my identity at this point. But the truth is, here's a shocker. I wasn't a very good science student. In fact, my middle school 
a science teacher told me that I was not science inclined, which meant that I was not meant for the sciences. And he said, you know, he shrugged his shoulder and said, science is not for everyone. <sighs> and I thought maybe he was right uh, because it took me an awful lot of mental work and hard work to make sense of all the abstract science stuff in my textbooks. And it, it didn't help that there was a, a notion, a popular belief at the time that male students were better science, better in the sciences than female students. So I hated just that notion that I'm limited in the sciences because of my gender. Um, and I must admit, I hated, I hated every moment of science class. I did. Um, so allow me to show you why, why that was, <laughs> why I hated science classes at the time. So let me paint you a picture. Um, it was a middle school. Uh, the first period was the much dreaded science class. The, the teacher, as usual, walked in with his authoritarian demeanor that made him unapproachable. As usual, he directed us to open our textbooks. The topic for that day was pollination. So he started to write on the black chalkboard, um, almost word for word, as it was in the textbook. You know, he wrote parts of the flowers and the role each part played in pollination. Then uh, we, he asked us to sketch a cross section diagram of a hibiscus flower, as you can see right here, just like it was done, it, like, that, like it was on the textbook. Then 15 minutes uh, to the end of class, we were told to close our books, to close our textbooks for a quick verbal quiz. And if you got the answers wrong, you are yelled at and called names like you moron and idiot. Now, do you see why I hated the class? And here's an even more messed up part in my dilemma. My parents wanted me to be a medical doctor. And why is that a big deal? Here's why. You see, I was born in southeastern Nigeria to Igbo parents. Um, a quick crash course about Igbos. Um, people of the Igbo culture are known for two main things. Number one is their inborn entrepreneurial nature. And number two is a demigod-like respect for the elders. Uh, so to oppose my parents was unthinkable. And in some cases, could lead to being disowned. So parents armed with their superpowers, so evil parents armed with their superpowers would usually have their children's career mapped out for them. So you know that conversation you would have with you know your parents when you were you know young or any kids in your life that go like, what do you want to be when you grow up? You know, you can be whatever you want. You can be a neuroscientist, you can be a neurosurgeon, a scientist, whatever you want to be, right? A geologist, you know, whatever you want to be. Um, this is what, <laughs> this is what it sounds like with evil parents. <laughs> As they assign careers to their kids, it, it was like, my daughter, you're going to be a doctor. My son, over there, you're going to be a lawyer, an engineer, right? And so they have all this careers planned out for the kids. Uh, and my father had 12 kids, so you can imagine how many medical doctors he planned to have in the family. Um, so, so you get my dilemma. I hated science, but to make my parents proud and avoid the possibility of being disowned, I declared a science major at 10th grade as uh, was required by the Nigerian education system at the time, knowing fully well that I sucked at it, at least according to my teacher, right? So I was doomed to fail on this science career path from day one. So how am I here 
with all the uh, with all the sciences and STEM that attached to my identity for almost 12, two decades. To answer that question, um, let's walk down one of my favorite memory lanes. Um, so the setting is summer break and I was still in middle school. It was a hot day in early August during the harvest season at a small farming village in southeast Nigeria where my grandparents lived. And it's the same city where my parents grew up in before they moved to the city. So um, in this setting, my cousin and I were hiking home from my favorite, favorite farming trail. There were a lot of the far different farming trails, but this was definitely my favorite. Um, and as we hiked home, we were each carrying on our heads a large load of fresh palm fruits, sustainably grown at my father, grandfather's farm. I'm going to demonstrate. <laughs> um, so, so uh, as we hike down this trail, on each side of the trail, as you can see in this picture, were two walls of soil towering above five feet high. And on these two walls of soil, as you can see, that was my pic the picture that was taken the last time I was home. Um, I could see distinctive soil layers on the soil walls. So as we hiked home, we walked past the Great Chuku Cave, as you can see in the picture, and we waded across a shallow groundwater that had sprung up a couple of days ago. That was a popular, that was a common phenomenon for some reason in that area. You just see shallow water pop up one day and it's gone the next. Um, so we walked, you know, we continued and we got home in my grandmother's quarters and we headed to the kitchen in the back where a bobbling pot of melon seed soup, mm, was cooking on the firewood stove. We carefully pulled down the fresh palm nuts from our heads and a quick delicious lunch later we went straight to work uh, to make fresh palm oil from scratch. So now I'm going to walk you through um, the steps that we took in making the fresh palm oil. And I want to add that palm oil is added in everything <laughs> that we cook in Nigeria. So it was a major, it's a big, big thing. So I'm going to walk you through really 16, about 16 steps in this puzzle. And bear with me and hang on, I have a prize hiding be behind these puzzle pieces. It's a very embarrassing picture of me. So hang tight. Okay, so the first step was we boil the palm nuts, to soften the nuts um, shell in the mesocarp that releases the palm oil that's held together by the fibers. And then in the next step, um, we pour the hot palm nuts into my grandmother's food processor on the right here. Uh, which is very different from my mom's food processor that we had in the city. And then the next step, um, we marched the palm nuts in the food processor gently. We didn't want to crack the kernels because that will release a different kind of oil that we didn't want at the time. And and we proceeded to, so the more we, the more we marched the, the palm nuts, the more the mesocarp loosened, releasing more oil. And then um, the palm pulp is ready for the separation process. So we added warm water to the mix, stirring vigorously to help separate the mixture. And, and um, the light fibrous mesocarp from the, the, the palm kernel, you can see the dissection on the left here. Um, so the, the light fibrous mesocarp with the emulsified oil pulp floats onto the top and the dense kernels 
song to the bottom. So next we collected the oily layer and boy did some more to get some of the oil from the mesocarp. And then we um, removed the fibers mesocarp from the mixture through filtration. So we used a sieve to, to sift through it. Next, we, next the remaining oily mix is uh, boiled some more to evaporate more, uh, to evaporate any remaining water content, leaving behind freshly made delicious palm oil. Now, as you can see, I, during this process, carried out separation of mixtures based on various physical properties of, of the mixture's components. And I use techniques like sedimentation, decantation, filtration, evaporation to separate an emulsion made of fibers, oil, and water. I sound very sciencey right now. <laughs> Who says little girls can do science, right? So, um, so you can see uh, during the course of this single day event, I had, I have learned geology, I've explored, and I've explored various ecosystems. And I actively dissected palm nuts in a deeper and more meaningful way than it was taught in class. As the, the image on the, the right is how it was taught in class, textbook driven and zero hands on. And this diagram from my textbook now makes more sense. I had an aha moment in my grandmother's kitchen. Those boring abstract science concepts that I constantly memorized now made more sense to me when I translated it somehow to my everyday life. And <laughs> There's your prize for sticking with me through that process. <laughs> this is the father of me and my fourth birthday. <laughs> awful, awful photo. <laughs> but anyway, this whole hike and palm oil making experience didn't only make me realize that I can do science, but it also helped me discover that science made more sense to me when I actively explored it hands-on and that I did every chance I got. For example, dressing the Christmas chicken was turned into an anatomy class. Tilling my, uh, tilling soil on my grandmother's farm became a soil science class. Making a trip to the local stream to collect water, which we did a couple of times a day, became an active ecology class. This is an actual photo that was taken from the village of kids coming home with bucket loads of water and buckets of water on their heads. I love grandma science camp. So as not ideal as my science experience were, even through college, I must say I'm super grateful for these, these experiences. Um, Frank Sonnenberg uh, said, and I quote, throw away a bad experience, but keep the lesson. I choose to hold on to this bad experience and save the lesson. These experiences drove me to the next phase of my journey. So with even less hands-on science engagement in college, I started, I started elsewhere. So right after graduation, 
I had it, I had it to the United States. First, as an international science research intern with National Park Service, where I was um, part of a team carrying out an experimental salt marsh restoration project. And a couple of years later, um, I was hired by Newark Museum as the coordinator of Explorers Program. Explorers Program is a STEM initiative for high school students. And my role as the Explorers Program coordinator was to design and implement STEM workshops for my students. Yes, a science educator, the one thing my father did not want me to be. What a lot of disappointment I was turning out to be. <laughs> but anyway, the program's uh, syllabus included bird identification, which in turn prepares them to participate in an annual word series birding competition in Cape May, New Jersey. As part of my onboarding for this position, I attended my first bird walk alongside my students. And here's the experience at the time. So imagine this, an inner city 14 year old woke up really early on a Saturday morning for a 6.30 a.m. bird walk. She gets in the van for a short ride to Garrett Mountain Park. And there she was handed a pair of binoculars she may not have used before. A quick crash course on how to use this archaic looking equipment. She was asked to practice looking at the birds through them. And as she tried to master these new skills in an unfamiliar environment, she was told this bird is this and that bird is that. And these are the identification marks that proves it. Sound familiar? I was once that kid. So if I must teach these skills to these students, I must make it familiar, I must make it relevant to them and a little bit more enjoyable. In my opinion, they needed to first explore this new concept in a familiar environment through familiar processes. So for familiar environment, I engage them with indoor birding events. I know, isn't, isn't the point of birding to be outdoors? Absolutely. But for urban teenagers who's rarely been out in nature, starting out indoors, I thought was ideal. So we went birding inside Newark Museum's Valentine House exhibit. And we had birds and picture, uh, stickies of bird pictures and bird figurines hitting all throughout the exhibit. And I had my students practice using their binoculars, spotting these birds and identifying them with their field guides. So let's do a quick exercise. I have a couple of birds hiding in this picture inside the Valentine house. So how many, how many birds do you see hitting in this image? How many birds can you see? And if you get, if you guessed it right, you are going to get a free deck of Birdwiser <laughs> exhibit card game. I'm going to give a couple of minutes. You can put in the in the comments um, how many birds you see in the image. If you get it right, the first person to get it right will get a free game. So Chitty, you want you want people to put some numbers in the chat. I'm seeing yes. some numbers come in. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Let me know when you want to know what the numbers are. 
So I'm going to go ahead. Um, I'll give a couple of minutes for people to hunt for the for, uh, for the images and for the birds. And then uh, I'm going to switch to the next slide. So you have a couple of maybe 30 more seconds <laughs> to spot the birds. Let me know how many you spot. Awesome, I see people looking. <laughs> this is awesome. Okay, and you have nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. And your time is up. So if you guessed, the first person to guess seven birds wins a free Birdwiser exhibit card game. Wow, I see, I, I see who that is and um, I'll send you their, um, their mailing address. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. So share if you are the first person to get seven birds, share your email address uh, with Susie and we will sh exchange um, mailing addresses and I'll send you a game. Congratulations to the winner. And so I'm going to move on. So um, young people in all parts of the world love to socialize. They love to play games and have fun. So how about including that in this boring experience, right? Why not? So I looked for birding uh, themed games uh, to incorporate into my workshops for the explorers. And um, I found a couple like bird bingo and flash flashcards. Most of them really didn't have much learning objectives that applied to my program. So I created some so like a bird version of guess who game. If you're not familiar with this game, it's a Hasbro game where each player has a card with a name and, and a face on it. And the objective of this game is to be the first person to guess the name of the uh, face on your opponent's card. Another game with similar objectives is uh, Mastermind. So this is our bird version of guess who we called it which is it because it kind of sounds like the call of a very impatient bird going which is it which is it which is it as you can see it has birds instead of faces and just like guess who the objective of this game is to be the first to guess who or in this case the bird what bird your opponent has and the students do this by asking yes or no questions. Like, does your bird have a crest? Does it have wing bars? Does it have a blue head? And as they gathered, as they gathered these clues, they eliminated the wrong birds until the last bird standing is most likely their opponent's bird. Um, I do have printouts for that bird, uh, for the bird version of Guess Who for people that are interested and I can email them to you. I, they're not commercially available <laughs> for obvious reasons. Um, but so if you're, if you're an educator and you'd like to use that in your class, please feel free to um, email me and I'll share that the files with you. Anyway, so Moving on to address the issue of relevance. Why are we doing this? Why do we care about stupid birds? Um, the, the I put the students in the shoes of migratory birds in a life science, a life-sized bird migration game. So, and in this game, they 
played the role of migrating birds facing the same challenges migratory birds face during migration, such as bad weather, habitat loss, pollution, and so on. And similarly, um, to help the students become familiar with bird songs and calls, I created a game I called Who's Call, for lack of a better word, a uh, better name. In this game, each student puts together a mat made up of grids with bird images like this one. Then uh, I'd play a PowerPoint presentation with the images of the birds along side their calls and songs while pointing out the mnemonic handles of those calls. And then I'd run through it a few times, then um, turn off the images and just play the bird songs. And each time a bird song is played, the students will step on the grid that has the image of the bird they think made that call. I also used a bird identification software that was available at the, at the time to engage the students indoors. And this um, software was called Thayer's Birding Software, and it generates an array of bird identification challenges using bird videos that were shot in, in your natural environment. And this also, the software also gives students um, points at the end of the challenge for identifying birds correctly. So naturally, the students really got into it and started competing with each other to see who gets the highest points. Um, we also had a, a bird-themed sleepover a couple of times at the museum and just to, just to address their need for social uh, events, so to socialize with each other. And uh, during this event, we'll have birth themed workshops and activities and some of what which I've already mentioned. And these strategies gently ease the students into this unfamiliar activity that is birding. But in the safety of a space, that is familiar to them. Then after they honed just their birding skills indoors, we took it outside. First, we started with urban birding in their very own neighborhoods around, around the Newark Museum or the neighboring Whitefish University compounds. And then we ventured into nearby, nearby parks. Um, and nature centers every Saturday in spring at 6.30 a.m. Um, and then months, more, months later, they were ready to compete at the World Series of Birding Competition, which is a 24-hour birding competition in Cape May, New Jersey. So you see, birding sneaked up on them hiding behind fun games and social events. They went from students who hated birding, who didn't want to get their sneakers draw, uh, dirty, to a team soaking wet in pouring rain in a committed attempt to identify a common yellow throat during the competition. And before you can say black cap chickadee, they went from being able to identify an average of five birds to 200 bird species. So you see how my experience and my first frustrations and my early science learning made me, I think, a slightly better science educator. My experiences guided me every time I created a curriculum, a workshop, or an activity for participants in the youth and, and family programs that I managed in the past 18 years. First, as a science teacher back in Nigeria, a youth program coordinator at Newark Museum, and the education program manager at Columbia University. 
And I must add, my self-discovery continued. You know, while I sought ways to make science learning fun for the explorers, I found that I enjoyed designing games that target specific learning objectives. So Birdwiser Games was born. So the first official game in the Birdwiser series is Exhibits, which some lucky person won today. <laughs> um, and this game features uh, 38 birds of Eastern United States for now. Hopefully it'll expand to other parts of the US and the world, hopefully in the future. I was inspired by a game uh, for, for bird, when I designed Birdwiser uh, exhibit, I was inspired by a game I used to play in Nigeria as a kid called What. And What is um, very similar, much older, but very similar to um, UNO, which is popular here in the US. And just like UNO, the objective here is to be the first player to discard all your cards. And when you play UNO, you match numbers and colors. When you play exhibit, you match the identification marks of the bird species on the cards. So here, I'm matching blue head to blue heads because the painted bunting and the blue jay both have blue heads. Or I could match, I could match um, a crest to a crest because the northern cardinal and the blue jay both have crests. There are also some negative action cards to highlight some of the challenges the birds might face. Most of them man-made. For example, landing on an oil spill would make you draw three cards and lose a turn in this game. And there are also positive actions that counter out the negative ones, such as recycling or raising funds for conservation, which is one of my favorites. <laughs> and uh, my second Birdwiser game is Flight Path. That name is subject to change. Um, this game is a bird migration board game where players take on roles of the last flock of their species. So they are about to become extinct. And so they are migrating from North America to South America and back to North America. Um, the players will encounter real life positive and negative factors during the journey. Now this game is still in development and being play tested at the moment, but we hope to, it will be coming soon on Kickstarter. So stay tuned. But at the end of it all, I found game-based learning. It was all accidental. I did not know it existed. It was this whole new branch of hands-on science learning that I didn't know was a thing. Um, and this discovery led me to become a game designer and publisher, and it's an endeavor that aligned with my natural inborn entrepreneur instincts as an evil woman. <laughs> um, but here I found passion and purpose that was fueled by unpleasant experiences in the most unexpected places and in unforeseen ways. I am definitely grateful to my teachers. I would be lying if I told you I didn't learn a darn thing in school, but I am particularly thankful for the lack of engagement that I had in my science classes. They created a positive driving force for me. I'm grateful for the aha moments I accidentally came across living at my grandmother's. All these experiences just worked together to awaken a passion I didn't know I had. And I know I didn't give my parents the title they wanted, you know, a parent of a medical doctor. Um, they ended up being the parents of a zoologist turned educator, turned game designer, turned, turned mom, 
entrepreneur. But but at the end, um, here's my takeaway from it all. Science is for everyone. Science is all around us. And science can be fun. And now I have um, one more mission that needs to be fulfilled. And that is to take what I've learned over the years and improve science learning in Nigeria. I still wonder every day why science was not taught, the, what science was taught the way it was, the way it still is, at least in Nigerian public schools. Why couldn't it be like grandma summer camp? Why didn't we learn about chemical reactions by making black soap like my aunt did at home? How can we make hands-on science? How can we do more hands-on and less rote memorization in Nigerian schools? How can we make science a little less like this? image and more like this how can we do more hands-on and improve the learning for the students sake these are questions i'd like answers to and i believe finding the answers to these questions will yield a step in the right direction in figuring out the root of the challenges, not only in Nigerian schools, but in other developing countries left behind in science education. I am, it's phenomenal what's happening in the US in how science education is taught here. Um, but there are a lot of other countries um, like Nigeria and other West African countries that are really left behind in science education that needs to be that needs to be addressed. And I'm still on a course that continues to make my parents proud in ways they didn't know was possible. Thank you so much for this time and for allowing me to share my wacky, my wacky stories uh, with you. And uh, I will take some questions now if there are any, Susie. Wow. First of all, that was just so fascinating and interesting and inspiring. And um, I, I, I wish that um, you lived closer to the Harris Center because we would want you to come and play with us in our, in our world here. So if you're ever in southwestern New Hampshire and Hancock, I, I hope you'll stop by so we can meet and um, talk science and teach science together. Um, Let there, me know and I'll make a trip out. Well, that sounds great. We'd love that. <laughs> we'll have to wait till all the madness of the Absolutely. pandemic is over. I, I, I think you stunned people. People are just, there's lots of people saying thank you. It was inspiring. It's so interesting. As for actual questions, um, if you have a question, you can put it in the chat. And I guess I have a question for you about um, kind of your plans for getting back to Nigeria and do you have a, a time frame on that um, and how I know you're you're a mom of a, of a young a little young person so what's your what's your thoughts so far so um, my timeline depends on a, a couple of things um, one the, the major one is my daughter uh, because of certain issues that are currently uh, going on in Nigeria, I wouldn't feel um, that it's, just, it's safe to take my daughter there. I am definitely, I mean, I grew up in Nigeria and it's capable <laughs> of anything it would throw at, throw at me, but I have a daughter who is currently four years old to consider. So the timeline will be when, um, 
I am able to navigate around, is it safe to take my daughter there or should I have my husband who is extremely supportive of all my endeavor, my crazy <laughs> endeavors, um, or is it with a thing that I have to leave my daughter be, you know, here with my husband for, I don't know, two weeks to go run a program at my alma mater, which I'm currently planning. So I'm hoping maybe maybe in a, a year or two. Right now, I am um, developing some programs that I will be rolling out when I do leave. So perhaps in a year or two. That's great. Um, so there are some questions. This is, this is a question from Karen Siever, um, who works with us on our staff. She's our um, an ecologist for us. And Karen, maybe instead of me reading it, why don't you just um, ask it? I think it's a great question. Hi, Chitty. Thank you so much. Such a, such a great talk. I love the stories and the images. Um, Thank you. My parents also pressured me to go into uh, medical science, <laughs> um, and I didn't go there either. Um, so that really resonated with me. Uh, I wondered what you could tell us about, you know, your take on barriers to science careers for Black folks in the U.S., um, and of different, you know, minority groups. Um, how, how, what are some of your takes on how we can do better in sort of um, attracting those people to those careers and just simply making them viable options for them? That's a fantastic uh, question, Karen. And I'm going to talk, uh, respond to that from experience. I think that the main, the main thing is, and that's coming from running uh, several mentoring programs for youth. And also speaking for myself um, as an individual, the key is to have or to, sh to showcase people that, so if I'm trying to get more minority groups in the sciences or in science research or in some career in sciences, they need to see or, or have mentors or see people that look like them doing the same exact thing. Um, as an educator, and I don't know if you've, if you've heard or seen, the, the, there's a research where students were asked to draw a scientist. And a lot of times they drew a white man in um, a white coat with crazy Einstein hair. And, <laughs> and a lot of times that's what they drew. Nobody drew someone that looks like them. Nobody drew a little girl, a woman. Um, so the key I think to that is seeing mentors that look like them and seeing people in that field that look like them. And that's also a personal struggle, even here in the United States, when you know, I went through mentorship, um, my first mentor was um, Hispanic and he was phenomenal, but that was rare. Um, and I felt that, you know, I needed mentorship, but I didn't see, or I didn't get men a mentor that walked my journey or that understands where I'm coming from. That was, that was great. Thank you. Yes, so well said. Um, so here's a couple of other questions. Um, there's a question from Donna Cooper, um, who, um, and I know I've been paying attention to this too lately in the news. She would like you to say if you could speak to any of the political climate in Nigeria, particularly as it relates to children being abducted, abducted from schools. Um. I left Nigeria a long time ago. I think it's been, I don't know, since 2007. And so I don't have, I follow the politics or try not to be too involved in it, but I think it's, it's a shame that you know, people, women or uh, girls are being adopted from school to, discourage them from going to school. I think it's 
a crime against humanity. Um, and I'm against it, 100%. But I, I think that it shouldn't... It's a scary situation. It definitely... That, that intimidation tactic... <laughs> I think it worked wonders. Um, and in the sense that, you know, a lot of times you want to think about your safety and the safety of those that you engage. Like, I have... Uh, a lot of my friends that are willing to make a trip to Nigeria and support all my programs. You know, I have doctors, I have educators that are ready to go. And then you see all these things on the news about abductions and kidnappings. And I worry about taking my family and my friends to, to Nigeria. However, um, I do recognize that also the media tends to... Um, hype things up a little bit. I mean, every country has their issues and every, you know, country has all roses, right? There are good things and bad things. Um, but I think that we shouldn't let it win. We shouldn't let those tactics win. We shouldn't let a kidnapping of girls make us not go, you know, do what we should be doing and make the kids not want to go to school because then they win. Yeah, yeah, well, well said, Chibi. Um, whew, here's here's a, a, a less intense question and one that I bet a lot of people are wondering about, and especially I have some students in the audience today that are um, part of my Lab Girls program, and this might be an interesting thing if, if they feel they want to be innovative. This is from Heidi, and she wants to know, um, she's first, she says, she always believes that learning should be fun which you clearly make, she wants to know, how do you take a concept for a game and go to the next step of actually producing a, a board game product? How did that, how, how do you do that? Um, so there are different ways to tackle that. Um, a lot of game designers who just come up with a theme and develop a game around it. But as an educator, I put the learning objective first. So you identify what it is you want people to learn from this game and then develop game mechanics uh, around highlighting those objectives and making sure and, and having that as an end game to your, your, your game that you're designing. So for example, um, Birdwiser Flight Path, the, the, the objective is to be in the shoes of migrating birds and facing all the crappy challenges that we throw at them, right? So crashing into tall buildings and black, bad weather, pollution, lighting and pollution and things like that. And also there's some positive things like, you know, um, creating wildlife um, uh, sanctuaries and preserves and raising funds to, to, to conserve wildlife. And so you put all these all these things you want the person to take away um, from the game and make it the end goal, and design the game around it. And at least that's my um, that's my process when I design games. I think about what do I want people to learn from this game and how do I make them learn it, and then work around it. That's great. I want to give you a shout out too for developing a board game as opposed to something digital because there's a lot of studies that show that board games really engage people, kids and people of all ages in a really different and profound way than a, a game on a screen does. And our mm -hmm. kids are kids are, nowadays are so used to screen games that to sit down and have material to manipulate and a beautiful your stuff is beautiful to have the the kind of the visualness of it and to sit across from somebody at the table and have to communicate that way. It's a really mm -hmm. different and fuller, full experience. So yay. Absolutely. And that's vital, especially when it comes to um, educational games, because when you're engaging, this is a little bit of the neuroscience coming out, um, when you engage the, the, the different senses in a learning process, you tend to retain the information more than when it's digital. And that, that, that's the same with writing out your notes by hand as opposed to typing it out digitally. Um, you retain more when you are writing out 
uh, by hand and engaging all the different uh, senses um, because you, your brain just um, just uh, consolidates all that information. You're processing information as you're writing it versus mindlessly typing it out. So absolutely. That, that is why I focus on tabletop. Maybe my games will go digital at some point, but my focus is tabletop. I want people to play it across the table, have conversations and interact with the game physically. Yeah, that's great. And we're just about out of time and I just really want to thank you. That was just fabulous and um, really exciting to hear you talk about um, your journey and inspiring for everybody. So thank you, Chitty. And thanks to everybody today for coming um, and checking this out.